Hi, and welcome to the continuing adventures of benchmarking my graphics card collection. And this is the third one in a row, so I think we'll have a break after this and do something else. But in the meantime, we are going to look at this card today. It's the ATI Rage 128 Pro, otherwise known as the Rage Fury Pro. And it's an interesting one, this, because it's the one with the ATI Rage Theater chip on it, which means it has all sorts of funky video editing and DVD decoding type stuff on it. So we'll take a quick look at that as well. Last week we were looking at the Voodoo 3 3000, which is still in the machine, so we'll get that out. Then we'll stick the Rage Pro in and boot into Windows, get some drivers on there. So today for your delectation, we have that funky 60s theme from the Windows 98 Plus pack. Then we get the drivers on and we get some funky TV type stuff, which I guess is related to the multimedia chip and increase the resolution and it all looks cool and ready to rock and roll. So for benchmarking, it's going to be same old, same old for this. We're going to do 3D Mark 99. We're going to do 3D Mark 2000 in both 16-bit and 32-bit color over four resolutions. And then we're going to do Unreal Tournament and then we're going to play a couple of games and then we're going to take a look at this DVD decoding type stuff and all cool. So the reason why I'm doing this particular chip is that it was one that was around at the same time as the last two cards that I've done. So it was very much contemporary of the Voodoo 3 and slower. <laughs> it was supposed to be a sort of saviour of ATI I think but it didn't quite live up to its name. Um, we'll have a look at the specs a bit later but it was around at the same time and you can see it in these magazine adverts again that all of these three cards that we've reviewed so far, the Voodoo 3 3000, the GeForce 256 and the Rage 128 Pro were all around in the shops at the same time. So without further ado, everything's set up. We'll get stuck straight into the benchmark for 3 d Mark 99 and see how it goes. And at the end, we'll do a little comparison with the other two cards, see how good it was. Scores are in for 3 d Mark 99 running at 16-bit color. 640 by 480, we've got a score of 7339 3 d Marks. And in the two game demos, we were comfortably getting scores in the mid-70s for frames per second. So a good start. Moving on up to 800 by 600, we've got a 3D Mark score of 6080, and we're still running at around 60 to 65 frames a second in each of the games, so that's pretty playable as well. Then 1024 by 768, 3D Mark score 4062, and we're still kind of playable. We're in the 40s to mid 40s for frames per second on both of the game demos there. Then we've got to the highest resolution things, <laughs> it dies basically. 10, 1280 by 1024, we got a 3D Mark score of 2647, and both the games were below 30 frames a second, so I guess you'd say they're probably unplayable basically. 25 to 29 frames a second we got. Now in 32-bit color, we get a score of 6917 at 640 by 480. And frame rates are pretty similar. They're around 70 frames a second for both of the games. So totally playable there. And then moving on to 800 by 600, the 3D Mark score was 5023. And both of the games are coming in at about 50 frames a second. So still pretty playable. Then 1024 by 768, we've got a 3D Mark score of 3343, and the games are over 30 frames a second, so it's sort of between 32 and 35 for the both of them, and so I guess they're kind of playable, not great, but playable probably. But then at the top resolution of 1280 by 1024, we're now down to around 20 frames a second for each of the games, so I guess that you're getting to the point where it's just struggling a bit too much. So the next bench is Unreal Tournament, and again we'll start with 16-bit color, running at 640 by 480. We've got 75 frames a second, so that's okay. Then at 800 by 600, we got 69 frames a second. 
1024 by 768, 50 frames a second, and 1280 by 1024 was 32 frames a second. So I think probably pretty much playable all the way through the 16-bit color uh, resolutions, so on to 32-bit. So 640 by 480 here, we got 70 frames a second, and 800 by 600, we got 55. 1024 by 768, 36, and then 1280 by 1024, only 22 frames a second. So I'd say it's pretty much playable on all of those resolutions, apart from you know 1280 by 1024 and 32-bit. So it's a okay card for sort of middle range gaming so that's the first part of the benchmarking over and done with so the rage 128 pro when it first came out in 1999 was really up against the tnt2 and the voodoo 3 probably as its main competitors being just prior to the advent of the geforce 256 and then a bit later the radeon kind of took things over with all the hardware tnl the core clock for the processor was 118 megahertz and the memory ran at 143 megahertz. I think it had two TMUs. It, I think it was capable, the chip was capable of running SG RAM and DDR as well as SDR, but this card only has SDR and it's a four times AGP card, the same as the others. Though that is quite confusing when I was looking at getting one of these because there's a Rage 128 Ultra, which I think is from the earlier card because the Rage 128 Pro was a follow on from the Rage 128. And the Rage 128 Ultra, I think, is part of the Rage 128 line of cards, but the Pro is a separate sort of next level thing. When the Rage 128 Pro first came out, ATI also released a tech demo to go with it to show off all of its fancy bells and whistles it obviously was designed to show it off and make it look probably better than it really was but it's an impressive thing to watch nevertheless so i'll stick it on at the very end of this video for anybody who wants to watch it it's worth a look if you haven't seen it so i got it running at its maximum resolution and it's about three four minutes long so i'll put that on at the end in the meantime before we look at the 3d mark 2000 benches I thought just to break things up a bit we can have a look at the the rage theater chip which is quite a cool little thing as well so this card has the Rage Theatre chip on it. Not all of them did, as I understand. Um, ATI had quite a reputation at this time for things like hardware, DVD, playback, you know, at a time when processors and software struggled to give good results and also sort of various video ins and video editing suites and all of that kind of thing. And yeah, we've got this chip here and I've already installed the software. So you can see this kind of toolbar that's appeared down the right-hand side of the screen. So we'll give this a go down the menu and see what we've got. First thing is DVD playback. So yeah, we'll pick an absolute classic and stick it in and see how it looks. Yeah, it was all magic. I think I was playing DVDs on computers before I got my first sort of home DVD player. I think it sort of appeared, it was cheaper to get a drive, a DVD drive on your computer. A lot of, you know, Pentium 2s and things had started coming with DVD drives quite a while before I got my first DVD player. So you could do things like this. And having the hardware, you know, a hardware decoder, it was, it was magic. And it looks pretty nice. And I'm sorry I had my, my microphone too close to the PC so you can hear a lot of fan noise, but just sitting watching it, yeah, it was, it's quite a pleasurable experience. So yeah, that works very well, I think. The next thing it's got, which wasn't much use or probably isn't much use anymore, is a video CD player. Video CDs were around for a while. You used to, quite often on a music CD when you used to buy them back in the day, you would get a couple of the band's videos 
also on the music CD so that if you had a suitable player, you could play them. And this would be such a player. And I do actually have a couple of these up in the attic somewhere, but I wasn't in the mood for going digging around up there, but I might come back and have a look at them at some point. So the next couple of options are actually pretty interesting and I'll probably definitely will come back to these at some point. So the first one is a video editor, which I didn't realize this thing had. So immediately started thinking, oh, I need to get myself an old camcorder or some such thing. And it would be good fun to make a, a full YouTube video using old gear, I thought. So I'm going to look out for a suitable video camera. And then the next thing down is we've got a video in. So I presume you could... Um, you could record things into it from a VCR or something like that. You can see here the inputs that we've got on the front to play with. And also from a said video cam a camcorder, you could input it using these inputs here, then edit something up using the editing software, and then push something up to YouTube. And that sounds like a fun little project for the future. And finally, the last thing we've got is an audio CD player. And initially this didn't work. And what I found was that the CD or the DVD drive I was using wasn't putting out sound to the sound card. So I quickly switched that out for a different model. You might have noticed if you'd seen the front of the box further back in the video, but it used to be a Plex store and now it's a Rico, but it works perfectly now. And without trying to get copyrights claim against me, I'll quickly give a blast of some funky Herbie Hancock. Yeah, let's just say that the CD playback works perfectly well. So it's definitely a nice bonus to have that kind of thing on a graphics card. Right, on to the last bit of benchmarking. So we're going to run 3D Mark 2000 now and we'll see how the card gets on with that. Okay, the results are in. So 3D Mark 2000 at 16-bit color. 640 by 480, we got a 3D Mark score of 5362, and we were getting sort of between mid-70s and mid-80s on the games at medium detail, and we were already approaching 30 on the helicopter game, and about 65 still on the adventure game, so that's all still playable. 800 by 600, the 3D Mark score was 3808, and we're in the 50s, low 50s to mid 50s it, it medium detail and high detail were 26 for the helicopter game and 50 odd for the adventure game so st starting to get unplayable at high detail 1024 by 768 we got a 3d mark score of 2461 medium details were sort of low 30s to high 30s and high detail was oh, into 16 sub 20 frames a second for the helicopter game, so it's already unplayable. 34 frames for the adventure game, so that's just about okay. 1280 by 1024, we got 1572 for the 3D Mark score. Medium details were now into the 20s for both games and almost into single figures at high level detail for the helicopter game and in the low 20s. So I think it's even at 16 bit color beyond 800 by 600. It's starting to struggle a bit. Of course, these are synthetic benchmarks and often don't relate to real gameplay at all in any realistic way. I imagine probably running most games at medium details are probably okay. On to 32-bit. We've got at 640 by 480 a 3D mark score of 4369. So frame rates at medium detail or in the 60s, so that's cool. High we're still almost in the 60s for the adventure game, but we're already down to 30 in the helicopter game. At 800 by 600, we've got a 3D mark score of 3012. We're in the 40s for both games at medium detail. And we remain in the 40s at the adventure game at high detail, but drop down to 20 in the helicopter game. So that's already getting difficult. 1024 by 768, we've got a 3D mark score of 1917. And we're in the mid-20s for both games at medium detail and at high detail. 26 for the adventure game and 14 for the helicopter game. So you're getting into unplayable territory again. But medium detail seems to hold up all the way through this pretty much. And then at the highest resolution, which is probably unplayable at both 16-bit and 32-bit color, at 1280 by 1024, we get a 3D mark score of 1177. 
and yeah, we're into into the teens and at medium detail and at high detail, we're even getting into single figures. So I think beyond 800 by 600 in DirectX 7 games, it's probably where this card's sort of going to be happiest and possibly tweaking the details down a little bit as well. But then again, it depends on the game. So what does all that look like on a graph? So 3D Mark 99, it's sort of fairly close to the Voodoo at lower resolutions, but the Voodoo pulls away the higher the resolution gets. And then it's obviously a little bit slower again when it gets to 32 bit, but it's not really in the same ballpark as the GeForce 256, which is kind of understandable, I guess. So into 3D Mark 2000 now, and it's kind of comparable again with the Voodoo at 16-bit color, actually much faster at 640 by 480 this time, and uh, probably a little bit faster at 800 by 600, but then the Voodoo seems to gain ground on it when you get to the higher resolutions and overtake it again. But they're fairly comparable, I think, and they're the cards that have been competing. I do know that the Rage 128 had fairly flaky drivers when it first came out, and they've matured considerably to the version that I'm probably using here. But yeah, that looks that looks like it is a comparable card with the Voodoo in a sort of more demanding scenario in 3D Mark 2000. Obviously, the 256 is miles ahead again. And it's surprising as well in 32-bit color, it's quite close to a 16-bit result as well, just trailing it a little bit. But so you know, it doesn't re really reveal much, except that it was probably comparative with the Voodoo 3, but probably not as good, certainly when you get up into the higher resolutions. So looking at Unreal Tournaments, this looks very similar between the Voodoo and the Rage 128 Pro at 16-bit, and that looks a bit suspicious that it's both on 75, I hope. I'm pretty sure that I had V-Sync turned off. I definitely did on the Voodoo, and I'm pretty sure I did on this as well. It just looks suspiciously identical in every resolution except it's a little bit faster in 1024 by 768 on the Voodoo and again at the, the higher resolution. But the the top, the, the lowest resolutions look remarkably similar, though 800 by 600 would have been below the frame rate cap of the monitor. So maybe they are just similar coincidentally, but again, nowhere near the 256 and yeah, totally playable frame rates until you get into the top end of the 32-bit color so well not totally playable a uh, tweak of detail level and i think you'd be all right i'd love to know what the the percentage of users per graphics card was back in those days because i know when you get the steam server that comes out these days you realize that nobody is keeping up with the sort of top of the range graphics cards i can't remember what the most popular graphics card on steam was but it isn't a recent one let's put it that way Okay, just to finish off with, now a couple of games that we've been playing with these cards. So Spirit Speed 1937, let's see what kind of frame rates we get. so playing this game feels nice um, we're kind of getting mid 30s is probably the average of frame rates here and it's very similar frame rate that we were getting on the voodoo though there are some noticeable sort of things 
I, I don't know if this game uses hardware TNL or not, but the surfaces of the cars with the 256 were definitely more reflective and sort of fancier in that way. But I think the biggest eye catcher of the three cards when playing this game was the Voodoo just had colours that popped a bit more and the, the greens of the fields and the colours of the cars and everything just seemed a little bit more vibrant. Um, though the frame rates on the 256, I think it got into the 50s and 60s at certain points, though it was sort of averaging around 40, I think. So it's a, a clearly a much faster card. Though to be honest, you know, when I play when I play games like this, you admire those kind of reflections, but you quickly forget about them and just concentrate on the game. If it's a good game, it's a game plays all that matters. And I would perfectly happily play this game. It feels fine, it handles fine, and it's just as enjoyable as it was playing on any of the other cards. One, go! So on Need for Speed Porsche 2000, again, it looked okay and it performed about the same. In fact, all of the cards seem to perform fairly similarly in this game. They were all in the 20s, which kind of implies that either Fraps isn't reading something correctly or this game is very smooth at 20 something frames a second. But yeah, it feels very similar to the other cards. I don't think. To be honest, as I play this game, I don't think it's a very, very good looking game. I haven't tried it in Glide yet. I'll have to try that. But um, yeah, in Direct 3D on all three cards, it's the scenery is pretty enough. It handles extremely smoothly. I've got to say, it's a very, very smooth driving game. Very easy compared to Spirit of Speed to actually stay on the road and stuff. But yeah, so I don't know how accurate this one is. It's sort of between the 20s and 30s on the others and here it seems to be hanging around the low 20s but still enjoyable to play and still totally playable so yeah so in this little bit of a test that I've done this card performs totally fine and I wouldn't have begrudged having one back in the day um, I think in the future I need to try and find some things that push each one's specific specific I don't know benefits a little bit harder each, each one's strong point a little bit harder but anyway that's pretty much it for this video um, at least I've got some data on three of my graphics cards now and I've got them written down permanently I think I do need to work out some better games and work out a suite of games that I can then apply to all of these cards as well so you might revisit them in that respect at some point but that's probably it for now for benchmarking and probably do something different in the next video in the meantime i'm going to leave you with that rage dawning tech demo which is awesome i really enjoyed watching that and it goes to show if you code close to the metal for this card it can do some pretty impressive stuff but that's it for now thanks for watching and i hope to see you in the next video